thank you so much for um, inviting me to uh, be the opening kind of keynote and set some of the tone. Uh, I noticed that, you know, in the survey, only about half of you were interested in scams. Um, I'm pretty obsessed with scams right now, and that's sort of what I'm going to be talking about today. But hopefully you'll see that this idea is, you know, generative and maybe um, connects to other topics such as governance, um, such as, you know, uh, DAOs and values and all the other things on the list. So, but anyway, um, the other thing I'll say is that I won't be using a PowerPoint. I'm just going to kind of talk from notes. Uh, so if, you know, to kind of try to break us out of like Zoom room, Zoom world, screen, staring at screens all the time, uh, you know, feel free to just treat me as a podcast and look at something else. Um, okay. So that being said, I will get into it. So, as someone who has been studying the social and cultural dimensions of money technology for over a decade, I guess, you know, Quinn blew up my spot that I've been around for a while and we're both not as young as we used to be. Um, so as someone with that experience, I have accidentally become an expert on, as I mentioned, scams. So that's what happens when you're a researcher immersed in the arcane worlds of e-commerce and cryptocurrency. You get to know all the ways that scams are produced and prevented. You watch the processes of how people who build and maintain economic infrastructures decide what's a scam and what and what's just business as usual, buyer beware. You get to watch how scammers adapt and evolve accordingly, and it's a never-ending cat and mouse game. Recently, scams have become a preoccupation of popular culture. Nearly every year since 2017 has been declared the year of the scam by various news outlets. There are long reads, podcasts, TV shows, Twitter threads documenting tales of scammers big and small. Uh, scams, we're told, are the new true crime. We, we seem to love hearing stories of the con game, perhaps now more than ever. We love and hate both players. The con artist is amoral but clever. The mark is guileless but um, perhaps a bit too greedy. The mark gets punished and maybe, no guarantees, the con artist will, will too. Big scammers might get biopics, but at the same time, the whole economy feels scammy. Multi-level marketing um, organizations, MLMs, have taken on a new life in social media. Retail investing and meme stocks work in the um, pyramid-shaped attention economy through platforms ranging from OnlyFans to Substack, um, the proliferation of certification courses from yoga to life coaches, and indeed, I believe that any honest observers would are, would agree that, you know, much of what happens in crypto, you know, shit coins, lots of NFTs, lots of the Web3 promises are also in this bucket, kind of this emerging scam economy. So today, I would like to consider the recent history of crypto scams and implications for the future of Web3. Of course, scams aren't new. Um, they may tell us something about how, you know, studying them might tell us something about how capitalism has always worked. But I think scams are particularly important to understand at the present historical conjecture because the boundaries between legitimate and illegitimate capitalism seem to be in flux. In part, this is due to the turn, larger turn away from traditional institutions of the capitalist economy and its twin consumer protection a term that both crypto and the mainstream platform industry are very much situated within and accelerating. More and more people are turning away from the traditional formations of middle-class life, the four-year college, the nine-to-five job, the retirement plan, because all of these things have started to feel like scams serving only a privileged few. And indeed, perhaps they always did serve a privileged few, but those numbers are dwindling. Instead, more and more people are patching together livelihoods of different hustles. Everyone knows to respect the hustle of the next person, to try to, try to always out-hustle them, but except when they themselves have been out-hustled. All of these hustles are frequently described as scammy, if not outright scams, even by the people who are participating them, in them. But in today's scammy economy, it's difficult to pin down exactly who is the scammer and who is being scammed. The confidence game, as we call it, is, you know, popular imagination and, and even in criminology is usually imagined as a game with two players, the con artist and the mark. 
But today's scams are better understood as, to continue this kind of game analogy, as part of a massively multiplayer online role-playing game. Like so much the digital economy, they are decentralized, multi-level, networked, what I call a network scam. So in my research, particularly in a just published, like just a couple of days ago, article um, in the journal New Media and Society on the 2017 ICO um, initial coin offering bubble, which was the last big crypto frenzy before the pandemic era boom, and the last big crash, perhaps the first or second crypto winter before this one, I have worked to understand, understand scams as a collective networked activity. To understand this, I turn not just to crypto bubbles, but to Herman Melville's uh, uh, novel, The Confidence Man. Published on April Fool's Day in 1857, The Confidence Man was intended to be a satire of commercial life in America, written in a moment like ours when commercialization and scams were a key public concern. The novel is also long and confusing to such an extent that one feels that they, the reader, perhaps have also been scammed, but that might be part of the point. The novel takes place aboard the steamboat Fidel, traveling down the Mississippi River. It, prevent, it presents a series of conversations among the passengers, most of whom are probably trying to scam each other. They include characters that would be familiar to anyone who spends any time on social media today. There are beggars who may not be what they seem. There's a guy dubiously raising money for widows and orphans. There's a sketchy stockbroker pushing a too good to be true investment opportunity. There's an employment agent trying to recruit um, um, young people uh, like young and inexperienced teenage laborers. And there's an herb doctor selling elixirs that will cure what ails you. Kind of sounds like Facebook. Um, aboard the Fidel, though, everything is blurred, maybe also kind of like Facebook. Conversation and commerce, commerce and con game, con artist and chump. Ultimately, it's unclear to whom the confidence man of the title refers. Aboard the, um, the so again, the, the, in addition to kind of satize, satirizing um, American commercial life, it's also satirizing the notion that scammers are bad apples an aberration inside an otherwise legitimate economy. Rather, it suggests that we are all a vast network of scammers whose interactions constitute that economy. So yes, scams are nothing new and neither is the network scam, but I argue um, they have taken on new valence in this networked economy. And as we turn to a Web3 knitted together in a tokenomic network, maybe even dare to dream about a just and equitable one, I think it's important to wonder after these network scams. Um, and generally, I think about network scams as a collective activity to bring about a shared future, a future in which individual wealth is increased, but also the economy and the larger social order is run differently. So looking back at the 2017 ICO bubble, ICO promised a future that looks a lot like what we now call Web3, in which a significant portion of infrastructures of economic and everyday life are, were organized according on the blockchain instead of by traditional companies and governments. Each, each ICO built a different product, and those products were stitched together via um, market exchange for their rainbow of tokens to constitute an internet of value. The resulting crypto economics or token economics opened up, as um, one observer put it, the economy itself as a design place, the design space. The token economy thus ramifies into the infrastructure of society. But I ICOs also promised to make their investors rich. By purchasing tokens, investors were buying at a low price in the very means of participation in the coming economic order. In the meantime, investors could make money by speculating and trading tokens on a quite robust secondary market. As with ICOs in 2017 and NFTs recently and Web3 dreams more broadly, investors weren't just buying a crypto asset that they hoped to sell at profit, though. They were also buying a vision of a future in which that asset is valuable. Usually that entails an internet in which monopolistic social media platforms have been replaced by decentralized Web3 applications in which the surveillant big data economy has been replaced by cryptocurrency microtransactions, with value flowing, of course, to early investors. But what makes these visions for the future scammy is that they are fundamentally characterized by ambiguity and asymmetry. Among those buying in, there is an uneven, but perhaps knowable, likelihood of benefit from the scam, and an uneven, and I would argue unknowable, belief in the likelihood of its promised future. In the ICO boom, and as now with Web3 Dreams, 
it was clear that those creating tokens um, and creating and selling tokens have a greater likelihood of material benefit now and in a range of possible futures than those bu merely buying and speculating in them. It's less clear and really impossible to know with any certainty who really believes in the decentralized blockchain dream and who is just in crypto parlance, as they put it, you know, pumping their bags. Um, to be more precise, as a longtime professional in the crypto community told me, I'll, I'll read this quote, come on, if you were given a zillion dollars to make a stupid thing, no strings attached, would you actually make that thing? If you basically knew it would be impossible to make it, and if you knew that even if you did make it, no one would actually use it, why would you bother? And if you knew you could make a, a zillion dollars to not make a thing, wouldn't you at least try? So I would suggest that the ICO scams of 2017 are a conflict between temporal scales. Um, the short-term financial, the short-term future of financial gain was privileged over the long-term future of building a radically disruptive economy. ICOs were predicated on the coming internet of value, um, on token economy, on Web3 and vice, and vice versa. In order for the token economy to come into being, ICOs were necessary to fund its development. But in order for ICO tokens to be worth anything and therefore not be scams, the internet of value would have to eventually come into being. So far, it is not. The scam is the misalignment between short-term and long-term futures, between individual and collective benefit. Um, and indeed, as another longtime member of the crypto community told me, it's not a scam if you hodl long enough, meaning if enough people hodl their investment long enough, if they believe or suspend disbelief long enough, the promised future will rush to meet reality. But on the other hand, he told me, no one wants to be a bag holder. That is, no one wants to be the only one holding a worthless asset that has already been dumped. No one wants to be the only one holding out for a future that will never come. But all participants in the 2017 ICO bubble, like all participants on the uh, Steamboat Fidel, and perhaps everyone kind of dreaming Web3 dreams today, were both. All oscillated between the economy as it is and the token economy as it could be between belief in futures, both short-term and long-term, between being a scammer and being a true believer. So the ICO bubble could be seen, of 2017, could be seen as a frenzy to bring about a future driven by a collective that only sort of believes in that future. So, you know, when I, again, when I talk to people in crypto, they tell me again and again to beware of everyone else that I'm interviewing or reading. They say things like, the thing you have to understand is that you can't trust anyone because everyone is just pumping their bags. And in this context, pumping your bags is indistinguishable from promoting your vision for a better world. A true believer is indistinguishable from a shill, and a shill is indistinguishable from a rational actor, someone trying perhaps desperately to protect their investment, perhaps even their life savings. Those who stand to benefit and who are cynical about the promises offered by today's you know, new economic formations could be called scammers, but the scam is only possible because of the collective effervescence produced by everyone involved, a kind of shadow multitude, as Hart and Negri put it, self-organized but without social contract. As crypto impresario Dave Portnoy put it as he was launching his own ICO in 2017, if it's a Ponzi, get in early. Scammers don't usually invite, <laughs> invite their marks to participate in scams in such obvious terms, you know, promising them a relatively high position in this uh, scam pecking order. But here we are in this milieu, traditional notions of progressive consumer protection not only feel paternalistic, but stop making sense. So my question today is, you know, or provocation for today is, as on Melville's allegorical steamboat, scamminess may well be the terms of participation in the Web3 economy, in social life itself. But can we imagine alternatives? Or conversely, can we live to learn to live with this uncertainty, with the asymmetry, with the a ambiguity of living inside of a, an economy marked by the network scam? Or do we just, as Portnoy suggests, be sure to get in early. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. There's a, there you go. Virtual clap. <laughs>
All right, that was wonderful. Thank you very much for that insightful uh, analysis of scams and Web3. We've got a few minutes um, for questions, so I'll keep it nice and casual. If you've got a question for Lana, please just either uh, put up your real or virtual hand, and I'll, I'll see if I can kind of um, moderate that as best I can. My first, if I can, while people are formulating some questions, uh, my first question to you would just be to know a little bit more about this idea of this network scam. Can, can you say a few, a few, few uh, words on what that, how the sort of dynamics of that work? Um, is it that it requires a bunch of people that makes it effective? Like, is it the network nature of it or is it that it's it just happens to be on a network? Yeah. I mean, I think the most salient part for me is this idea that you know, when I was getting really interested in scams, um, um, I read a ton of the kind of sociological, criminological literature, as well as like kind of popular coverage. And the obsession was always with the scammer. Like, who is the scammer? You know, um, what what is their profile? What do they do? And then also kind of like victimology, like who's the mark? Um, and as I looked at all of the things that were being called scams today, including things like Theranos and, you know, um, but then, you know, ranging down to ICO scams and MLMs and that sort of thing, none of them had a clear con artist. Like we can look at, um, what's her name at the center of Theranos as the scammer, but really the it's only possible because of the vast network of venture capitalists who really want to believe um, or at least want to believe long enough to realize their investment. Um, and so I became a much more interested in kind of Elizabeth Holmes. Thank you. <laughs> um, much more interested in thinking about scams where, which is far more pervasive according to you know what I was seeing, um, where everyone occupied a kind of ambiguous space. And then I went back and I also read Melville's Confidence Man, which is widely talked about, but never read, I don't think, as like the ur text of, of scams. Um, and, and it seemed that, um, you know, that whole book was about the ambiguity and asymmetry of, of who really is the confidence man, who really is the victim. Um, and it just so happens and, and, so, and then I do think there's a relationship with networked communication, network media, where, of course, that kind of formation is exactly what we're seeing, you know, more and more in this communication environment, network communication environment. Uh, I don't know if it was Gina or Jeff who was first. Uh, one of you guys want to take a stab at it there? Jeff? I um, really enjoyed your talk. Um, I, I've got uh, two questions. One, um, could you um, talk a little bit about um, physical events and, and people coming together and how that plays into um, what, for the most part, is a network scam that's virtual? And then also, um, I'm interested in, um, have you interviewed uh, venture capitalists and, and do they see themselves as um, getting in early and, and and perpetuating the scam, but, but profiteering off of it. Um, to take your second question first, I haven't interviewed venture capitalists. I didn't write about VC as a as a network scam. Um, I think that that's an interesting question. Um, I'm I've been more embedded in investor communities, like retail investor communities, and most of my research is based on that. Um, but my suggestion around Theranos and VC and stuff was more that I was looking at like the big scams and the culture and sort of seeing how they compared. And I didn't, and it, it's kind of speculative, but it's sort of easy to imagine that there isn't that much difference between accredited investors and retail investors um, and some of their behavior. Um, so yeah. And then to take your second, the first question, <sighs> um, I mean, in-person events, are are really interesting and i would say 
most of my research up until three years ago was all in-person events, like meetups, um, uh, industry events, that sort of thing. And of course, like everyone else in the last two, three years, I've been mostly at home (laughs) or at home a lot more than I had been before. And so that's, I hadn't really thought about it, but it is interesting to think about what happened during this big speculative bubble over COVID and like to what extent um, the lack of in-person events may have driven some of that behavior. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm curious, can you say a little bit more about, at least for the set, that first question, like, or either question, like why you, why those were interesting to you? Um, you know, I've just read about uh, meetup and meetup culture in these events yeah. uh, and, and uh, have, have, have wondered um, what goes on at them. I haven't attended any and, and um, and I'm a historian of computing, and I've long studied um, uh, uh, different financing mechanisms and, and kind of business and social history. So um, how mm-hmm. how the VC uh, industry works um, out in Silicon Valley as well as elsewhere it has always been. Yeah, uh, I mean, intrig- super interesting. Intriguing. I wish I had had more to say, but I think there's connections, but I don't have. I can't speak to them from my research. Oh, thank you so much. I love your thank- work. Yeah, thank you. Gina? Um, yes, thank you. That was a great talk. Um, and it's not really an, an, an aspect of the field I think that much, I think about it, but not, not in these words. Um, so something that's, I know you haven't worked on the NFT uh, frenzy that we just finished up, but I am curious to think about what you were talking about in terms of ICOs in that NFT market. Specifically, um, what's interesting to me is, because you had pump and dumps there, you had some all sorts of really fun activities, um, but there doesn't seem to be as much of a um, the, the the painting of the brush with scams with the word scam is not as as easily applied. And I was wondering, in your perspective, from what you've seen, is it this notion of a legitimate network scam, right? The art market, it, it, or the the parallel to the art market, where it's all word of mouth and this kind of frothiness anyway. And we recognize that. So do you feel like if you transpose your what you saw with the ICO market, what you've learned with the ICO market to the NFT market, is my sense that there's not going to be a whole bunch of pitchforks coming out from regulators in this field. Is that correct, do you mm. think? Mm. Just, just yeah. because we accept it. It's a great right, market. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, an interesting thing about the ICO moment, I mean, the NFT moment as compared to the ICO moment, as you kind of point out, is, you know, in the ICO era, people were – making fake websites, um, writing, pay, going on Fiverr and getting someone on Fiverr to write a fake white paper. They were stealing pictures and identities from LinkedIn to kind of assemble their team. Like this ICO has all these top talent from post Google, post Harvard, this Bitcoin person, but it was all fabrication. You know, this elaborate performance of legitimacy for something that would have a pump and dump that would be ran over the course of like hours, you know, days or hours. Um, And with with this last kind of bubble, we didn't see nearly as much of that performance. Um, It was kind of like, buy this thing. Is it going to be useful for anything? Uh Ah, you know, like there were some talk about how NFTs would solve problems related to intellectual property or um, the creator economy or bring about, you know, usher it like as a kind of gateway into bringing people into um, the like real pressing concerns that people who have like idealistic um, and technical hopes for Web3 were actually trying to solve. But a lot of people were really just thinking about NFTs in terms of trading cards. You know, like you buy a baseball card at some point, maybe you sell it in the future, maybe you make some money, maybe you don't. Um, and I think it's interesting that the in the popular discourse, and I did do some interviews with with NFT um, like investors who were not at all immersed in the COVID space, I mean, not COVID space, in the crypto space, um, like people who just kind of came to this uh, for the first time. And, and their expectations were far less grandiose and there was like far less expectations. Um, and yeah, like if, if we, 
if in the ICO market, we felt the need to pretend and an NFT, and I'm saying NFTs are the broad brush. I know that there's a lot of interesting stuff that was legitimately happening with NFTs, but I'm talking about like my mom's best friend at the, you know, um, 55 plus community who bought like an NBA NFT and then sold it like a few weeks later, who doesn't care about any of this stuff at all. Um, in this end, it's like a lot of that pretense has been dropped. Um, and so what does that mean for like the longer term trajectory of, of retail investments in this space? Um, and yeah, it's interesting. Like if there is, if that pretense is dropped, um, I don't think that at least under US law, it will fall under the similar regulatory regimes. Like NFTs are less of like a Howie issue, um, which is like, yeah, than, than ICOs were, for example. Um, so fewer promises made, uh, fewer regulations courted. Does that, does so it's that interesting. Speak? It's, it's just yeah. interesting to me because I definitely remember there were NFTs, especially early on, where they were just like putting a link or essentially sending out a link, not actually an NFT as, as right. we would understand right. it. So there was still, like, I feel like there were a lot of scams now. We sort of look back and it just feels cleaner. And I'm really curious as to where that feeling comes from. That it just feels, feels which part feels cleaner? NFTs. Like it, it feels like it was less of a scam market than ICOs, even though, especially at the early end, there was a lot of weirdness happening there. But that so do you think it was cleaner because there was there were fewer promises being made? Like you buy this this bit, and hopefully you know, I've sent it. Yes, and hopefully you receive it, and as long as you receive it, it's all good. I suppose yes. Right. Like the check, the ordering is much so. Much, right, much right. So it's not like with an ICO. Oh, you buy this token, and in the future, this token is going to be part of a global network to save the whales. Once we figure out how to make it all happen, and you're funding the development of our of whale coin that's going to save the whales. Um, and but in the meantime, there's a pump and dump and a disappearing act, and you know. But in a NFTs, it's like you have your your claim sort of to the, a, you have your receipt for this image, the end, you know? Um, so it's almost like by promising less, they are less scamful because the like contours of its scamminess are more apparent. Like it's more clearly speculative than like promising anything. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's really interesting to me. Um, thank you. This is really interesting. Um, and in, in line with one of the projects I'm working on, is, which is new technology, old crimes that are crimes that are using blockchain or some aspect of this technology to evolve in new forms. And what you were mentioning on ICOs, like I was there back in the day and it was a lot of projects didn't know their scams and they were like trying to actually make it. Um, but to me, it's really similar, like ICO scam and even NFTs are really similar to traditional fraud in the sense that like they ask people for money and people actually intentionally put their money. Um, I wonder if you looked into the airdrop scams, which is like a different aspect, which you go to your wallet, you see you have $20,000. And in order to claim that, you have to go through a few hoops. And one of them that actually, it's interesting that even I'm, it's my field and I fell for it was something called Minerium, I think, that they gave like tokens to a lot of people. You had to deposit some Ethereum to get it out. But then as soon as you would put your Ethereum, you become this agent in this Ponzi scheme because you have to get more people in there to unstake your money, which was fascinating to me that I felt for it and I was trying to figure out how I can get out. And there was no way to get out until I was becoming the network and the agent on this. Um, have you looked at airdrops or the newer version of um, I haven't looked at it in a systematic way, but I'm aware and like your account of it is, is really fascinating. Um, and I would be, yeah, I'd be interested in how you're trying to think about this and how you've been kind of theorizing. Yeah, and that. I have a lot of data on this point too, like we can talk later and see because it's that, a new yeah. generation of crimes that didn't exist before. Like it seems like right. you're sending a package to people's house and ask them to do something about it rather than yeah. asking for it. For you in your research, how does the kind of novelty function? Because you can kind of think about this as like, it's kind of like phishing, but it's kind of like a chain letter, but it's kind of like an MLM. But yeah, then the it. Yeah. yeah, the main difference is like when you send your, the token to the users, you can create a market on the side. So it seems that they have the money. So they see the value of the money in their wallets. 
So it's a diff bit different to asking them to click here and do something. They already see twenty thousand dollars in their wallet. Um, it's similar to like yeah, I don't know, like maybe it's similar to like fraud checks being mailed to people and asking them uh -huh. to wire back. Yeah. It's more similar to that. So they see the money and then they're like, oh well, I get I send this much money back. So it's a different s scheme. Uh, so I would like to see how in the criminology aspect, how would that uh, fit? Yeah, I know that's fascinating. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy. I would love to talk with you more about it. This is a good opportunity, of course, to mention that um, there's the if you go on to the uh, Troll Conference website and you click uh, the participants uh, button, passwords is Web3, and then you'll see the database, and then of course you know what everyone's emails and whatnot are there. So that's an opportunity for us to out of band reach each other. Um, we've got uh, Farah and uh, then Seth. Hi, Lana. That was really Hi. great. It's great it's to see you. Great. Yeah, you too. It's always great to meet you. And actually, I should say, Farah helped with some of. What, Farah and I were in touch when I was writing this paper, and and Farah's done her own line of research on ICO scams um, from the time. So, but yeah, I mean, it's all still like amazing ideas from Lana. So yeah, don't give me any. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess what I wanted to ask, which I wanted to kind of like press you on as well, and maybe this is like a good opportunity, is I love I love your context and the way that you're framing it in terms of um almost like like a like a human condition that basically it's just always and and especially though that you're like historically grounding it that like it's just something that like is is just part of society the way that people will always go into it so i guess what, what and i i kind of thought of this with um gina's question on you know how like she's bringing up how nfts that just they, they appear cleaner and more legitimate and i think that like um I, I think zane even like made some kind of a comment with that in like the chat as well um I guess um, what I wanted the chance for maybe to just like explain more is like, um, you know, the the fact that, you know, that scammers are getting the chance to like put on these like performances and find ways to connect with people. And that's actually really amazing. Um, so yeah, is that, is that just something that like, are they just being faster and more innovative and are they actually kind of like the best kind of like social readers out of all of us? And yeah, I hope that one day actually you also get the chance to like just directly interview and study scammers. Yeah. Yeah. I like got myself sucked into this bizarre CBD, not bizarre. I shouldn't say this, but I'm in this like CBDC project right now that put my kind of scam research on hold to some extent. Um, but I think that, and then of course the whole world got really interested in scams. Um, and I was kind of like, well, I'll come back to it when people lose interest, which is like kind of my way, um, like studying ICOs in 2020. Um, but anyway, um, the question of like cleanliness and this kind of, um, I noticed this comment about OpenSea and the way OpenSea and other platforms like produced this platformization, like produced this like feeling of cleanliness and legitimacy, I think is interesting um, thinking about like platform capture and informality. Um, so like I did a line of research a while back where I interviewed like ride sharers in New York city and like, a, you know, ride sharing drivers and a huge number of them had worked previously as like what is called, this is the, you know, the term like gypsy cabs in, in New York city where they were just driving from like finding places in the subway network that were poorly connected, but high traffic and just like driving cars back and forth between like two subway stations and picking people up along the way. Um, and they didn't, they were outside of Manhattan. So I think it's a slightly different, mostly like in the, the boroughs, but slightly different, um, setup. But anyway, they were technically scammers because they were evading licensure from the taxi board. Um, um, and so, and, and then, you know, there was this concern about consumer protection and all that. Um, and then what happened was when Uber and Lyft came about is they all just became Uber drivers. So they were like made legitimate through the processes of, of platformization and like made formalized, made to count, but nothing about their lives changed. And if anything, their working conditions became worse um, and like nothing about and I, I don't actually know. I think it's an open question and one that I'd be skeptical of is like whether or not like consumer protection prevails in that instance. Like, am I safer because I'm with a an Uber driver, a Lyft driver? And as we've seen, you know, Lyft like engaged in some serious cover ups of consumer protection around this. Um, so, yeah, the question of like platformization, formality and the like feeling of scamminess, um, I think, and, and and whether or not that translates into like social good um, 
is an is is an interesting one. Uh, Seth, uh, I think it'll be the final question for Lana. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, is your use of the word scammer or scam supposed to imply some intentionality on the part of the scammer? Um, I mean, I think one of my main points, um, and I hope it came through, was to kind of deconstruct that notion. Like, um, like you know, we, we're all, if, if we're engaged in some kind of speculative activity, then we're all kind of oscillating between a position of, of being a, a believer and a kind of scammer who's trying, well, I should say a speculative activity that t attempts to drum up further retail speculative activity. Um, we're all kind of o oscillating and like living in the ambiguity of simultaneously getting, maybe getting scammed, maybe being a scammer ourselves, um, and, and maybe somehow kind of avoiding either of those categories. Um, you know, there's this line from that I like about, about like I first heard it about plants and like the, this idea that a weed is a, um, a, a plant, a, a weed is a plant out of place. And I think about scams as kind of like capitalism out of place, like where, where we as some kind of collectivity, as a society decide like these are certain forms of like legitimate exploitation and investment, you know, legitimate exploitation and, and illegitimate exploitation. And I think that right now the lines between, you know, that, that boundary work is kind of falling apart. Like we're not really sure anymore what's a scam and what isn't. And so I am, so to answer your question, like, I think I look at scams, like the idea of a scammer as like a word to be interrogated and studied. Um, it has yeah. a tremendous amount of, uh, you know, value ladenness. And I wonder if the froth, uh, you know, is necessary for the creative process. And mm -hmm. Making this dichotomy is somehow, you know, how does it help? Well, um, I will actually share a line about that that I think was really interesting from um, a, and I can just uh, end with that, um, a line from a historian of capitalism more broadly. Um, where is it? I just had it. It was something I was going to say and I didn't say. Um, where did it go? Well, Anyway, um, but like essentially, you know, yeah. So historian Stephen Mim has said, and he was talking about the 19th century, that, you know, at its core, capitalism, by which he means like the entire economy of like building up the then like quasi nascent United States, capitalism at its core was nothing more than a confidence game. Because as long as confidence was nourished, even at the most far-fetched spec, even the most far-fetched speculations could get off the ground and wealth would increase. Um, and it's just this idea that like, as long as we like drum up this froth of collective belief, things are going to happen. Like it's the engine, um, that mix of like true belief and greed and, um, is the engine that, that makes things happen. And like that may well just be part of the process. Um, and we sort of talked about, and I think, you know, Farah kind of touched on this a little bit, like we've, we've, we've developed systems of deciding what, what, what parts of those mechanisms are okay and what parts aren't. And that's kind of fallen apart a bit, like the institutional withering. And so we're now at a stage where we know we want the engine to go and we know we want things to change. And we have stumbled on these ambiguous mechanisms through which we might make that happen, but we don't have like a good roadmap um, for figuring out what it is, you know, you know, how we draw lines. Like someone asked, like, what is the social contract of the network scam? And I think that that remains to be seen. Um, and I think for the purposes of this conversation around Web3, you know, crypto at its heart is deeply rooted in a kind of caveat emptor ideology, right? Like um, one of the, you know, the earliest refrains um, in early crypto was like, no, in early Bitcoin was like no chargebacks. Like, like there, we don't want, there's no safety nets. 
do what you can, be a wise investor, um, and and take the loss if if you get scammed. And and I think that that kind of ethos has been really productive. It has nothing has brought more attention um, and more interest and more involvement in like building things than than the potential, you know, the kind of like scammy froth in the in the space. So, I mean, I think a lot about I was around in like free software times and free culture times. And the thing I think is really interesting there is that in free software, it was like vo similarly voluntaristic, like build things for you and everyone else to be able to use. And um, and there was like almost a allergy to money and a, like an allergy to figuring out how to pay things, um, pay for things. And then now so many, like many of the same people, um, have kind of swung completely in the other direction, um, uh, are still trying to build like free infrastructures that are voluntaristic for kind of, you know, the benefit of it's, it's those who attempt to provision it, but it's, it's tied to kind of like micro transactions and like, it's like hyper financialized. Um, so as Quinn pointed out, like, a you know, a, a subreddit with wallets, like, um, so like, how do we think about trying to make horizontalist, decentralized, free and open technology for a, a that's an alternative to the kind of monolithic platforms and monopolistic platforms that's like either like allergic to money or hyper financialized? And I think the hyper financialized one, arguably, you know, certainly has like gone more mainstream. So like financialization and avarice and the shadowy other of which is you know scams is like a, a driver of innovation and a driver of, of interest so that was kind of rambly but i think it's you know it's interesting thoughts